You got a picture, James? Sure, Joe? Yes. Hey, 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 check, 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 one, two, 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 hey, 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 check, 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 one, two, let me see here. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. on Wi-Fi, right? Pardon me? On yes. That's the correct number. Um pretty with my Mac, but it was um, apparently it doesn't work with dual core machines, you need clock order. Um works with this, so I I'm not Super familiar with architecture of the MacBook Pros. This is like a four year old no, MacBook Pro, and no, it's. No, it actually is clock okay. They started like downgrading them essentially. Oh, really? It's, God, it's crazy. It's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, man. I'm a Mac person, but I am really not happy with the current state. I work with a lot of people who are slowly moving to Windows machines. I like Mac OS too much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Do you need more plugins? We have another power strip. Steal, uh, the intercept HDMI. Ooh. Oh, you got a USB going over there. Um, yeah. So we it does a pass through. Okay. I don't need, I don't need like a so we've been we've been sticking with shorter HDMI runs because Rich feels that's more reliable than the long ones I used to do. So you would have to patch in up there. <laughs> and the long, the long cable that's coiled there is from the machine. So if you pull that one out, plug into you, and take your pass through into that. Then... Hey, Grant. Thank you. I appreciate that. You have a better setup than we do. We should just let you record this. And we, I can go. Home. I actually do this for like other conferences. Oh, do you do for... Donut JS as well? Yeah, yeah. I've met you before. Okay. I gave a talk there last year. Oh yeah, I remember that. that. So nice to meet you again. <laughs> oh, you guys practically know each other already. He he records Donut JS sometimes. At oh, least. cool. Yeah, uh, actually, most of the time. Okay. Hey, look at us having extra plugins too. I was trying not to overcommit you. I think you. we have a. <laughs> yeah. If you want, I think we have an additional uh, power strip. If you want to just run right. one even farther over or something. So to answer your question, I think the Elgato is passable. Like it, it's just like a Dar pro, you know, consumer piece of gear. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because you're capturing too. Got it. 
<laughs> which, which two? But, uh, That's, that is a challenge, <laughs> for sure. Time is at 6.34. I think Rich is going to use this and hand it off to you since this yeah. is our main audio source. Is that like a like a clip on? The yeah, yeah. Shirt it's got it's thing? got a little clip. Um, okay. So just clip it. I usually on a t-shirt like that just kind of you know double it up and clip it somewhere down there. It's pretty sensitive, so you don't need to like position it somewhere you know across the, your chest is fine. Yep. Mm. You probably want it before. <laughs> I'm Nate, by the way. James. James, nice to meet you. To meet you. Do you live here in Portland? No. No, I, I'm living in San Francisco right now. Ah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> One of my coworkers does live here, though. <coughs> yeah, he's, he's somewhere around. He's the guy with the other camera. Cool. Are you local here? Yeah. Well... Yeah, I live across town, so it doesn't feel local, but yes, I'm in the Portland area. <laughs> the greater. Oh, I was just in Southern California last time. It's always a good reminder when you come back to Portland, like, Portland is still, like, a really small town. Like, you drive on the freeway, it's just yeah. like, this isn't anything remotely like driving yeah. on the 405. I think, I think LA makes almost anybody feel like a small town. <laughs> yeah. That's like one of the biggest cities in terms of sprawl that I've ever seen. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Uh, the first time I flew into LAX a long time ago, I remember the, the captain of, of the plane said, like, okay, we're descending now. We're, you know, about to land. Right. And then it was like 30 minutes of flying over, like, solid buildings <laughs> right. and, and right. suburbs and stuff. And yeah. I was like, does this city never end? Yeah. It's like a, yeah. It's a chorus on or something. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is the most number of people we've seen in the room when it's time to start. <laughs> I guarantee you this is the most the most number of people you've ever seen come out to a authorization yeah. protocol talk. No, exactly. It's exactly. It was like this All the time for <laughs> Hey everybody, how you doing? Good. Right answer. Woo. We got a good one for you tonight. Does anyone know where that line comes from? What? Just gonna shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Wire yourself up. And he's gonna no. shout. Yeah, oh, play at time. He's gonna talk for ten minutes. The first answer was the correct one. Family food. <laughs> anyway, we got a good one for you guys. So there you go. <laughs> it is April. Who thought it was still December, practically, between weather and, and everything else? Jesus Christmas. Uh, Nate came to visit us. Where did you come from? San Francisco. I've heard of that. Yeah. Down, down southern Oregon, right? Little little town down south. <laughs> I mean, we're in Northern California, so you can be Southern Oregon. Sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. So, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have some fun. I am fairly certain that a lot of people know these places, but just in case you don't, we have these places to find Pad Nug. Test, Take test. A picture if you'd like. One, two, test, test. <clears throat> I put the emphasis on the YouTube because we try to stream them like tonight i think we are successful is that true james we are we are streaming tonight we are streaming we are streaming we're live Woo! Woo! so if you hear something you thought was really cool tune into the stream really fast and you know like about what eight seconds later you can hear it again right yeah <laughs> well it gives you time to bleep it out exactly. yeah, unless we bleep it out exactly if he drops an f-bomb uh, you know, i don't i don't know if we're fast enough to bleep those out anyway <laughs> There's the uh, Wi-Fi password if you've missed it. I see the cameras coming out already. We'll give it a moment. We've had F-bombs before, just so you know. I get really excited about OAuth. <laughs> so do these people. <laughs> I know, I can tell. <laughs> yes. We exist pretty much because Microsoft came up with this little thing called .NET a long time ago. I think that was just the green screen was still over, right? Um, back in 2001, I believe, is when uh, a bunch of folks that were here at Intel said, hey, Microsoft's got this new platform and languages that are coming out. And they say, let's put together a group that's going to meet every month. Well, it's grown a bit since then. <laughs> I think there was maybe half a dozen people those first meetings. Now we have a lot, a lot more. Yes. 80 to 100 is our typical. And then there's that big December meeting. 
everyone been to the December meeting? I know Jeff hasn't, but who else? Is that about a lot, yeah. There's a lot of you haven't. We get dang near 300 people at the uh, big December meetings. We get extra food. What's that? I don't know why. I know. It's the food. It's, it's the food. It's Kidoba. I'm pretty sure it's Kidoba. The big prizes we get away. We always have good, good swag. There's a speaker. He's, a, he's okay. And yes, his wife has accepted that night as, a, as scheduled. So we ought not have any trouble with having to last minute reschedule that meeting. Who's Do I need to bleep that? The Scott part? We didn't say his name <laughs> until just then. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Also, thanks to, mostly thanks to Darren, we have a great place to meet every month right here at Intel and sometimes Jones Farm too. Intel also, by the way, in case that's not obvious to the auditor. We have supporters. We have Thirsty Lion. I have gift cards to give away. No Amelia's. I'll go get those as soon as I get off stage. And JetBrains, ditto that last part. We have those to give away tonight. Um, we have the architect level supporters who provide money that helps us have pizza every month and all those cool things I mentioned for the December meeting. Home Depot, is anyone here from Home Depot tonight? I know there's, I'm sure they're still hiring because they were last month and I'm sure they didn't fill all those yet. <coughs> IT Motives, I know you're in the house. I'm gonna let Angelo present. Okay, My Angelo, we haven't seen you for a while, we miss you. Seminary, and uh, yeah, uh, I haven't been to too many pack dogs lately. It's just, you know, sometimes life gets in the way, but I'm here tonight. Um, Alina's in the house. I know you guys really the famous know. Alina. The famous wow. Alina Sconyers. We have a lot of new. We have a lot of new partners that we're working with this spring. We have a lot of new roles and a lot of what I'd call really unexpected things. Um, we have some amazing new .NET. C sharp Microsoft stack roles in downtown Portland. You don't see that every day. And we have stuff all around the region. If you want to stretch your legs and maybe move to Bend or Eugene or Southern Oregon, we probably have something for you. So I won't be at the after hours tonight, but I think Alina will be. And uh, yeah, bump into Alina, make her buy you a drink. <laughs> make her. Or buy, let her buy you. Be drink. honored if she <laughs> goes to the trouble of buying you a drink. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Uh, Robert Half is not here this evening, but he oh. mentions a few things. So, uh, multiple front end positions right now, many more to come. Uh, view Angular React in addition to your general uh, Microsoft development. <coughs> and. Uh, and I talked to Josh this afternoon too, and he said he's got a whole lot of stuff coming that includes React and someone, I don't know who the client is, but whoever the client is may be very willing to help train you in your uh, front end developer skills. So keep that in mind with Robert Half. Uh, Andrew, did you wanna, oh wait, no, we've got uh, Tech Systems. And you wanna say anything about Home Depot while you're at it? <laughs> Cause you usually do. Hi Danielle. Yeah, we work really closely you do. And it's your turn. Also. I am Danielle from Tech Systems. <laughs> um, a lot of you know me, some of you don't. Um, you don't have to make me buy you a drink for the after party. <laughs> I'll just do it for fun. Um, just be honest. We have a lot of roles available. We always do everything from JavaScript to .NET and a couple of Mm -hmm. That's crazy, but they're, they're there. They're, they're still it's there. a fertile ground for that right here, you know. There's, there's, I know there's people here who can do that. <laughs> At the very least, I'd like to network with you and, and know your name. So. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. <coughs> your timing is excellent, by the way. Did you see that? Um, new relic, Andrew. Did, uh, did you want to speak on <laughs> his behalf again? <laughs> uh, that's. Matt, Matt was unable to make it again, and Andrew volunteered very kindly to step up on this. Matt was pissed, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Texas has never bought me a drink. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. 
Uh, yeah, Vander Hound always seems to buy you drinks. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Jesus. Yeah. Uh, wow. It's, uh, good thing my wife doesn't watch these things. Uh, Till tonight. I made some stupid excuse about why he wouldn't be here, and then he said, with that being said, we have an opening for an engineering manager uh, for our .NET agent team. So if anybody, uh, you know, is like into software development management and wants to help New Relic out with managing people, that, that might be something fun. I've heard they're a pretty good company. Um, and then they also uh, need a full stack JavaScript developer um, who also likes to play around with Ruby on Rails. So, yeah, Very good. there's Matt. Did you want to say your spiel too? Since, you know, Vanderhound's on this slide. So, um, yeah, uh, I probably won't be at the after hours today. I know. I know. Um, but I have a couple of people here who will. So Taylor and John uh, will be at the, the after hours, and they probably won't buy you a drink because they're cheap. Um, yeah, they totally would. Um, but anyways, we, we, uh, we've been doing this for a really long time in Portland, and um, we, we work with uh, probably most companies. If somebody is into like .NET and Java, like a little bit of both, um, I have a 100% remote rule um, right now that you can do. And then I also have a 100% uh, remote uh, Node.js position, so kind of focused on Node.js. It does require like a couple of days of travel a quarter, but that's, that's about it. Very cool. Yeah. Taylor, you'll buy Danielle a drink, though, won't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> A catapult. Charlie? Yeah. Your no, turn. I'm not going to do catapult. The owner's here. No, Charlie's here. He can do his own thing. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Charlie Phillips. I'm the owner of Catapult Recruiting. Where we specialize in technology engineering. We did the same thing everyone else talked about previously. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up is we're not just a staffing firm. We're actually giving back to the community. We're going to sponsor Habitats for Humanity. Uh, 18th annual breakfast, which is April 25th, it's a Wednesday at Portland Convention Center. Free. Love to have everyone here come and uh, visit our table. We're doing good, good things for the community, and if you are interested in a job, please come talk to me or grab my business card. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Yep. Um, Adroit. Uh, we haven't had a person there from them for. Well, we've never had a person from there, but they gave us money some time ago. So I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, soft source. Anyone from soft source other than me? Man, we really got to work on that. Okay, so I am at soft source, and I know we're hiring. So there's that. Let me know if you're interested, and I will make sure you connect to the right people. Also, I'll use that as a stepping off point. Oh, wait, I do want to, uh, Jeremy Abbott, where are you? Hey. <laughs> you had something to say? Yeah, uh, kind of piggybacking off Angelo, I work at the downtown Portland company that's hiring a uh, full stack. Income. Uh, income. You can say yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be working that kind of. I am going to be there Monday. Yes. 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 Uh, so we're hiring a ton of positions uh, SQL EDA, systems engineers, uh, full stack software development. Don't okay. necessarily have to be .NET. Um, so if you're interested, you can hit me up or hit Angelo up and um, we'll figure it out. Very cool. Yeah, it, it actually is a really good location. Like, yeah, yeah. We're just coming out here. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. Bank Tower for anyone who cares. And the uh, Philly Cheese Steak just a block down the street on Fifth is <coughs> best in town, in my humble opinion. It's, I'm not, never humble though. Um, <laughs> so we have a new thing, and my uh, my friends at Soft Source actually are going to help put this on. Starting April 10th, second Tuesday. The only Tuesday we haven't already booked, we're going to start doing an Ask the Experts deal every month. Now, I think we're going to switch it to third Tuesday, not least of which because TypeScript might want second Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> but we got it here this year. I'm sorry, this month. What the, the expertise is going to change from month to month, but the format's going to be the same. There might be a short presentation at the beginning, but the idea is, Bring out your problems and help get them solved. 
So I think it could be a very popular thing, and I also want people to raise their hands, virtually at least, to say what you might want to be an expert on. So if you've got something, you a problem you've solved, and feel like you've uh, had a lot of good luck with it, I'd love to hear the ideas so that we can put on an expertise session with that. So. Then uh, a week later, Pad Doug is the has the West Side Geek Dinner. You guys do Geek Dinners, Nerd Dinners down south? Every night's a nerd dinner. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is in my house. <laughs> However, we gather together so that our significant others can have a break <laughs> and, uh, and, and go to, say, Thirsty Lion, for example. You've heard of this place, I'm sure. The day after that, oh, I missed, almost missed the TypeScript, sorry. Hey, would you like to mention anything about the TypeScript meetup? Sure, uh, If you happen to live on this side of town, meaning not downtown or on the east side, um, we actually have our meetings out here. Uh, so it's a short drive. Come check us out. Uh, we have two talks, one on Angular's AOT ahead of time compiler, and um, another one on using TypeScript with Node. It's going to be more like a workshop-y kind of presentation. So Very nice. Bring your laptop. I, I, that, that. When we have the re React version of that too, I'd like to see that one. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Padnug, uh, okay, Westside, Agile PDX will have reframing Scrum for hardware. Interesting. On the 18th, we've got uh, Eastside Geek Dinner on the 24th. And if you didn't catch the nuance there, probably ask the experts and the Westside Geek Dinner will switch uh, May or June. Then Portland SQL Server meets on April 22nd. Yeah, I should have rearranged those. Padnug, May 1st, we've got Nick Mahonen coming back. Oops. Always a good presentation. Exactly. He's doing WebAssembly this time. I'm excited because he, he puts on great uh, gigs for us. And, whoa, somebody really screwed up the uh, Web Valley Software Engineering. What do you actually have going on down there, Angelo? Our very own Gene. Chill. Sorry, that Nate's not going to Salem next week, <laughs> next month. I, you were going to check your calendar. I, I, I was yes. going to. I had a moment of panic there. I yeah, was don't like, worry about it. That was me. <laughs> James Church, our own James Churchill will be presenting at WBSE. And is that a, is that the one? The React versus uh, Angular. Yeah, it's going to be a cage match between React, Angular, and Vue.js. Woo! Excellent. Oh, no, that's that's going to be hot. Yeah. I'm really good. sorry that those words aren't on there because that would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> It would. And if you don't know what a cage match is, I don't know what, how else to describe it. So. What's that? Oh, it's more than 25 minutes at this time. It's okay. It's worth it. It's closer than you think. It is. It's closer. No, it's not. Anyway, I, I, I've been to Salem way too many times to think that. That meetup draws very well from this crowd. And oh, of course it does. Because there's people in, from Salem here. <laughs> anyway, so May, of course, ask the experts, west side, east side. And then July, I want to be keep promoting this. What do you got happening in July down there? Oh, just this guy by the name of Scott Anselman. Yeah, he's boring. But it's going to be on a different Who? Uh, week. Normally, we meet the first Thursday. We had to do the second Thursday in July. Oh, yeah. I didn't That's even think about that. OK. Yeah. Did you clear that with Rich? What? <laughs> Tuesday's all I care about. Thursdays, <laughs> you, have, you can have them. Uh, all righty. And? Anyone else have an interesting thing going on? An announcement? New babies? I got engaged. I think we discussed that last month. <laughs> okay. So afterwards, we all head over to the Thirsty Lion. Nate's been there, so he knows where to go. Who else is going to be going? Come on, put your hands up. I know there's more people than that. I should just go with my gut and say how many people I think are going to go there. Okay. Because you all lie uh, every month, practically. I, I ask for a count, and oh, yeah, maybe, uh, and then everyone shows up. Like, it's okay. <laughs> but it's wrong in the right kind of way, right? It is. Last month, we, what, we had about 30% more than raised hands. So it was a great time. And we have plenty of room, so do not hesitate to come out. They reserve a whole side of the bar. If everybody shows up, we might want to forewarn them. That's all I ask. <laughs> so. So if half of you decide to come out anyway, just let us know. Well, with no further ado, Nate, come on and out. <laughs> Woo! All right. Yay.
Is that yours? This is yours, and this is mine. Awesome. <laughs> Give me one moment while I do the old switcheroo here. Churchill, you can see your screen. Make sure it's all happening. And we have him wired. I'm wired, that's for sure. <laughs> Me too. <clears throat> and we can swag out your books here. That's that'll happen at the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we have, we have. Coming on up. Oof. Doesn't look good. It does. It punked me. The ver first time I plugged in, it was just fine. Let's see, so this is two. So it says the optimal is nineteen twenty by twelve hundred. Tiny is okay. <laughs> Everybody move closer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's see if that works. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Nate Barbatini, and I work at a company called Okta down in San Francisco. I don't get to say down in San Francisco very often. I'm normally, uh, normally south of it. Um, I'm super excited. This is my first time in Portland. I'm super excited to, that you were having me here to speak at your meetup. Um, I'm giving a talk called o OAuth and OpenID Connect in Plain English. Um, this is not as boring as it sounds, I promise. Um, but before we get into that, I just wanted to mention that um, my Twitter is up there. I'm, I'll tweet the slides and the, and the stuff out from this talk right afterwards so you don't have to worry about like taking pictures of the screen if you don't want to. I'll put all the slides on Twitter. Um, you can follow me if you want more, more info about this type of stuff. Security and um, .NET, ASP.NET is what I kind of talk about a lot. Um, and also the team I work on at Okta tweets under at Okta Dev, so we tweet a lot of like security related interesting stuff there as well. Um, okay, so what I want to do is um, I want to try to break down OAuth and OpenID Connect, which are two protocols that are typically very confusing to understand. Just as a show of hands, who here has ever worked with OAuth or OpenID Connect in some way? Oh no, all of you. Okay, almost all of you. Anybody here consider themselves like an expert on OAuth or OpenID Connect? That guy doesn't count because he wrote the book. I Really? Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm not an expert on it either. I am a, a security layperson who started working in the security industry a couple of years ago and found this extremely confusing and then tried to, tried to understand it. And my process of trying to understand it ended up being a useful thing to talk about because it turns out that a lot of other people were confused, not just me. So I want to start with some history of these protocols and help, maybe help you understand why they're so confusing and help you break down how they work and understand them a little better. So just to acknowledge, like I said, there's a lot of confusion about these protocols online. Um, if you've ever Googled something like, how does OAuth work, or what is OpenID Connect, I'm sorry. You probably found some really confusing stuff, um, and you probably wanted to tear your hair out. What you most likely found is a lot of the stuff that I found, which was a bunch of articles that talk to you about the protocols as if you already know everything about them. So using all this really dense terminology and jargon. But if you're trying to learn this stuff for the first time, you have no idea what they're talking about. So that's really, really confusing and really frustrating. And there's like a really steep learning curve to a lot of that jargon. The other thing that you'll find is just completely incorrect information, like bad advice. So you'll see like one dude's blog saying, <clears throat> you're supposed to use OAuth like this. And then like the top answer on Stack Overflow says, 
that guy's 100% wrong. You should never do that. That's the worst thing you can do. You should totally do this other thing. And then like somebody, somebody else says that they're both wrong. So that's really confusing and frustrating as well. These are all the things that I found when I tried to learn this for the first time. So what I want to do is, like I said, go back in time a little bit, go through some history about these protocols. And I found that a kind of a useful exercise to understand why they work the way they do. And that illuminates as well a little bit of why they are confusing in the way they are. But I'll get to that in a sec. So let's imagine that we jump in a time machine and we take our time machine back to like 2007. That is more than 10 years ago now. Um, and that's like 42 internet years ago. It's a really long time ago. So way back in 2007, just like today, web applications and websites had to handle a lot of different like identity or security related stories or use cases. You had what you might call like a simple login situation where you just have like a form that takes a username and password, looks it up in a database somewhere. Hopefully you're like hashing that password and not storing it in plain text, you know, logging in. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Um, that's kind of like your simple login. Sometimes that's called forms authentication. Um, and that works really well with like forms and cookies usually. Um, there's also a, a use case or a story around doing single sign-on between multiple applications. So one account signing into multiple systems or federating across systems. And that's usually done with a protocol called SAML. Anybody here worked with SAML? A couple of SAML. Did you have fun working with SAML? Anybody like it? Not really. It tends to be really... Um, really heavy and very XML-y, which if you like XML, it's probably great for you, but not everybody does. But around the 2006, 2007 timeframe, there were a couple of new use cases, new, new stories, new devices that came on the scene that didn't quite fit into these buckets really cleanly. So a big one was mobile devices. So for the first time we had mobile apps, a whole new category with native apps that weren't websites. So like cookies didn't work really well. But they, weren't, they, they also ne didn't even necessarily show a web browser. So like you couldn't do SAML very well either. So that was a new category. And then there was this other thing that some people were kind of thinking about called delegated authorization, which also didn't really have a good solution back then at the time. Now, that fourth one is actually what I want to dig into first. So I want to dive into delegated authorization. I promise that it's not as boring as it sounds. It sounds super like dry and academic. But... Um, by looking at delegated authorization, we'll understand where the OAuth protocol came from originally. And then we'll talk about the kind of how it evolved. But if we look into this thing called the delegated authorization problem, the most academic sounding thing, of course, but this is actually a really simple problem statement that we probably interact with every single day, and maybe you didn't even realize it. But this is the idea that I have my data in some website or some application over here, and I want to let another application have a little bit of access to it, not very much, just a little bit of access to it in, in some standard way. And if you think back in like 2007, there wasn't actually a good way to do this. Today, you probably have a million times clicked through that screen, that pop-up that says, you know, yada yada is trying to get access to your Facebook account. It's going to give them access to your birthday and your public profile, but it won't let them post on your behalf and you click accept or deny. Who's seen that screen before? Probably clicked yes to that a million times, right? And now you have like Farmville connected to your account a million times. Um, so that's a really common pattern now, and we take that for granted, but that pattern didn't exist like 10 years ago. That pattern, just to spoil the surprise, that pattern is the OAuth protocol, but let me get there. So. Back in, back in that time frame, 2006, 2007, there were not any good ways of solving the problem. There were just bad ways of solving the problem. So this is kind of a, an infamous screenshot from the early days of Yelp, um, where Yelp tried to solve this problem, but they did it in a not so great way. The thing that they did was at the end of their registration flow, they did something that was fairly common, kind of normal. They said, hey, you just signed up for Yelp. That's great. You probably want to invite all your friends to also sign up for Yelp, right? So we, you know, let's email them an invite code, because that's exactly what all your friends want to get from you, right? So that, but that's like fairly normal. A lot of sites do that, right? The way that they implemented that though was they said, okay, give us your Gmail address, cool. Give us your Gmail password, just in case you're, just in case you weren't clear what they were actually asking for. They said the password you use to log into your Gmail email. Not the password that you just set up for Yelp. 
So they said, okay, we'll go log into your Gmail account for you. We'll grab all your contacts, send them all an email. Then we'll log out. We pinky swear we're going to throw away your password, not do anything evil with it. Um, but that's cool, right? And it's not cool, of course. That's like horrifying um, in, in terms of the security implications. It turned out that Yelp is a, like, they're a fairly reputable company. But back then, they were just a startup. Like, who knows if they were doing anything right? Um, so this was a really bad way, of <laughs> bad way of doing things. I would not recommend you using this pattern to, to connect to someone's Gmail account. But I'm not trying to pick on Yelp too badly. They just didn't have a good way of solving this problem back then. Now we have a great way of solving this problem. Um, it's called the OAuth protocol. Just as a side note, this pattern is still used by one specific type of industry, one specific type of application, and it's even still used today, and it drives me crazy. Anybody, what? Banking. Banking, yes. Yes, anybody here use like Mint or Wealthfront or any of those like financial dashboard apps? They always say, we need to connect to your bank account, so give us your real bank account, uh, you know, log in your real bank account password, and we'll log in for you, and we promise we'll keep this secure. It drives me crazy. The banking industry is the only industry that has not moved to using something like OAuth for doing this. Um, about three months ago, I heard a rumor that apparently some bank was going to do OAuth for the first time with Mint, which is crazy because that's like the industry you hope would have the most security, but it's terrible. Anyway. Back to the main topic. Um, so instead of doing something like this, here's what you could do instead. Here's how you would use a protocol called, like OAuth, specifically OAuth 2.0 in this case, to solve this problem in a much better way. And I'm just going to use the same exact problem statement because it is a really good way of kind of illuminating the issue. So let's say that you want your users to be able to finish their registration on Yelp and connect their Yelp account to their Gmail account so that Yelp can get maybe just just their contacts email addresses. We don't want to have like read write access to their contacts. We just want to have read only access. We just want to get download their list of contacts and that's it. So now that since the internet kind of adopted OAuth 2.0 as this big standard that everybody uses, we can do this in a really standard way. I'll show you how it works. What you would do is you would start with a button on your application. We'll just keep using Yelp as an example and say on Yelp.com, there's a button that says something like connect with Google or authorize with Google. User clicks on that. What happens is that they're redirected over to Google. Specifically, they're redirected over to accounts.google.com, which is something called an authorization server. I'll, I'll mention that in a sec. But over on accounts.google.com, now they are asked for their, their Gmail, email, and password. But at least they're more comfortable giving their Gmail password to Google, because they're at least giving it to the right, the right people, right? They're not giving it to Yelp, they're giving it to Google, staying within the Google security system. After they authenticate, after they log in, then they're given that, that prompt that I mentioned before. That's pretty common on the internet now. That prompt that says, are you sure you want to allow application XYZ, Yelp, to access these things? Your public contacts, your uh, public profile, your contacts, whatever. Whatever the application's asking for. And the user is explicitly given the chance to click yes or no, you know, accept or deny. Let's say the user clicks accept. If they click deny, then we're done. We don't have any more interesting things to talk about. But if they click accept, the user is redirected back over to the original application, back over to Yelp, to a special place on the Yelp application called a callback or a redirect URI. And then a little bit of magic happens behind the scenes, which I will explain in just a sec. But the Yelp application gets something called an access token that is stamped or, or, yeah, stamped, embedded with the information that the user had clicked accept or yes to that prompt. So the access token then becomes the way that Yelp can go back to Google and say, hey, Google, normally you would not give me Nate's contact list. But I have this access token that proves that, proves that Nate said, yeah, it's OK for you to have my contacts. So Yelp can go up to some API, maybe contacts.google.com, say, please give me Nate's contacts. Here's the access token proving that I do actually have permission to do that. And then Google will say, OK, normally I wouldn't let you, but yes, Nate gave you permission. Here's Nate's contacts or whoever's contacts. So this is the whole, this is the whole thing. At a really high level, this is exactly how the OAuth 2.0 protocol works. It's a protocol for exchanging this type of permissions information between systems. If one system, or if both systems support the OAuth 2.0 protocol, 
then the application can say, I want these permissions in your system. And the a system on the other side will say, OK, let me make sure the user's OK with you having those permissions. User says it's OK. Sure. Here's an access token that says the user said it was OK. That's how the whole thing works. Now, this is super high level because I didn't actually use any of the real OAuth terminology, which is where the learning curve gets kind of steep sometimes. Some of the terminology is kind of dense. But what I'm going to do is go through this flow, this diagram, like five more times. You'll get really tired of it. And I'll kind of add in the terminology step by step so you can see how all these pieces work together. So let's add some of the terminology in right now. In the OAuth 2.0 protocol, we have some names for stuff that we already have names for. They just renamed it for some reason. So instead of users, we talk about resource owners. But a resource owner is just the user behind the keyboard who can click yes to that prompt, who can say, sure, I allow this, this permission to be given. A client in this, in this OAuth land is the application that needs that access. In our example, that was Yelp. The authorization server is the server or the system that owns the user's identity or owns their account. So accounts.google.com, in our case, is where the user can log in and actually give that, that permission. The resource server is a, the system that actually holds the data that the client wants to get to. So in this example, we were saying that the client, Yelp, wants to get access to the user's contact information. That's some, somewhere in Google, but it's actually a different API than the authorization server. That's like the contacts API. So sometimes the authorization server and the resource server are like the same system if it's like a small system, but a lot of times they're split out. I'll show you how that works. When the user clicks yes or accept or allow to that prompt, they generate, the authorization server generates something called an authorization grant. That authorization grant is just a, a temporary token or temporary thing that proves that the user said yes to that prompt, and that's sent back to the client. But ultimately, what the client is after is not an authorization grant. What they really want is an access token, because that's the thing that will allow the client to go make API calls to the resource server and say, hey, resource server, I want that data, and I have this token proving that I have access to that data. So the client has to go from getting an authorization grant to getting an access token, and I'll explain how that works in just a sec. But this is some of the terminology. This is kind of the base terminology you need to understand how this works. Let me go back through that flow, and I'll show you how each one of these pieces work together. So we start off here on the client, which is Yelp. And we have the user, presumably sitting in front of the keyboard, sitting in front of the screen. That's the resource owner. They have an account on Yelp, and they also have an account in Gmail with some contacts. That's the data, the resource that Yelp wants to get to. When the user clicks on that connect with Google or connect to my Google account button, they're redirected over to the authorization server, which is accounts.google.com. And when I say redirect, I mean like an actual full page redirect. The URL, you know, window.location is changing. We're doing a get request, moving the browser over to some place on accounts.google.com. Along with that redirect, we send along, the client sends along some information, some different parameters like where we need to end up at the end basically where the authorization server needs to redirect back to at the end. That's what's called the redirect URI. And then also what type of authorization grant the client wants to have at the end. For now, we'll just talk about one type of authorization grant called a code, which is like the simplest one. Because the client is asking for the code response type or the code grant, this is commonly referred to as the authorization code flow, because that's what the client is getting at the end. So, by sending along those parameters at the beginning, this request is kind of set up and sent over to the authorization server. And then the authorization server's job is to actually make sure that the user is OK with granting these permissions and allow the user to click yes or no, prompt them for consent. Are you sure you want to allow Yelp to have access to this stuff that they asked for? Assuming the user clicks yes, then the, the browser is, again, full page redirected back over to wherever the client asked to be redirected to, the redirect URI. And along with that redirect URI, along with the get request, the authorization code is sent back to the client application, usually in the form of a query parameter. So that's just question mark, code equals, and the authorization code. Now, 
I mentioned that what the client really wants is an access token. And right now we don't have an access token. We have an authorization code. Well, it turns out all the client can do with the authorization code is make one more request back up to the authorization server and say, hey, you just sent me this authorization code, but what I really want is an access token. So here's the code. Can I exchange it? And I'll give you the code. You give me an access token. If the, if the code is still valid, if it hasn't been like tampered with or made up or something, then the authorization server is going to say, cool, yeah, I see that I gave you that code. Here's your access token in exchange. And then what the client can do, now the client has what it really needs, the access token, and it can go make a connection to the resource server, call some API on the resource server and say, hey, contacts.google.com, I want to grab this, you know, Nate's contacts. Here's the access token that proves that Nate said, yes, you can have access to those contacts. All right, everybody feeling good so far? Does this make sense? Question over there? <laughs> is that encouraging spamming? Uh, yeah, it probably is. But it's always a problem I've had with OAuth, just like logging on Facebook. If you do that, you are giving that entity full access to your contact list. You might be. It so, so why even bother doing it? The whole premise doesn't make sense to me. Well, it doesn't just have to be giving Facebook your contact list. We're actually not talking about authentication yet. We're just talking about authorization here. We will talk about a. Right. But actually, we're not. OAuth is actually not for authentication. It's misused for authentication, but it's it shouldn't be used for authentication, actually. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to OpenID Connect. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, you probably shouldn't, <laughs> but there are there are times where you would want to be able to exchange a little, like allow some system have to have a little bit of access to your data somewhere else. Maybe for you, you would never want that to happen, but you can imagine situations like, let's say that I want, I have a bunch of photos in my Google Photos, and I want them to be printed at Walgreens instead of downloading them all and putting them on a flash drive and going over to Walgreens and plugging it in, maybe I could allow Walgreens just to have access to my Google Photos or maybe just one album of my Google Photos so that they can print them online. I don't know. And maybe you, like, if you're really privacy and security conscious, maybe you still wouldn't want to do that. But the idea here is that you could at least have a little bit of control over it. Instead of saying you have full access to everything in my Google account, at least OAuth gives you the ability to scope it down and say, you just have access to this little thing here. But that actually raises a really good point, because I haven't talked about how we can ask for exactly the permissions that we want. So OAuth is all about authorization, exchanging permissions. Um, but authorization and permissions are only good if you can make them granular. right? You, would, you don't want to be able to, kind of to your point, you don't want to have the only options is no access and full access, because that's kind of useless as an authorization mechanism. So in the OAuth world, we have this idea of scope, which is just a fancy way of saying the specific types of permissions that I want. And the flip side of that is this idea of consent, where the user, whatever permissions the application asks for, the user has to explicitly grant. So there's no, there's like, Kind of no funny business in the sense that the application can't just say, like, I want this little bit of access and then actually get a ton of access. Did you have another question? I was going to say, you kind of have the premise that the scopes of websites are benevolent organizations, you know, not false news, you know, they advocate for terms of settlers. And OAuth and what you're suggesting is we should trust all these organizations with all of our data. I'm not suggesting that. Well, one example where this technology is in different ways, this is a nice easy way to talk about it in a decent way. Yeah, no, to be, to be clear, I am not in any way advocating that 
social networks are benevolent or that you should trust them with all your data because I don't think either of those statements are true. Yeah. So OAuth actually gets confused with social authentication a lot. Um, OAuth is much more than social authentication, although that is like the main, probably the main thing that most people see it in that context. So a lot of people think that OAuth equals Facebook or OAuth equals social, social login or social networks. Um, that's kind of unfortunate, I think, because it's a pretty powerful protocol that's used in many other areas, not just, um, not just logging into Facebook or whatever. Um, a good example is what I hope will happen, which is Mint and the banks can agree that they can both use OAuth 2.0, and then I can say that I can connect, you know, in a read-only way, I can connect Mint to my banks so they can see my, you know, my account balances, but they don't have, like, right access to my bank account. They can't make transfers or something, which is not possible today by giving them my full bank password, right? So it is true that OAuth is unfortunately discussed a lot in the context of social networks and Facebook and stuff. And I am using Google as the example here just because it's a really like easy to understand relatable example, but it is used for much more than, than social networks. Um, so I mentioned that the way that we can ask for specific permissions in OAuth is by this idea of scope. And a scope is just a string. It's just a string that has some label or some meaning in the authorization server. So this might be, in Google's case, there's a scope called profile, which means that you're asking for permission to just read the person's public profile. Uh, there's a scope called contacts. I think it's contacts.readonly, which gives you read-only access to the user's contacts. But there's a separate one called contacts.rewrite that gives you read-write access to the user's contacts. So you can imagine that if you are building an integration against Google or you're building an integration against any OAuth, anybody who speaks OAuth, the first step is you'd go to their documentation, understand what all the different scopes you could ask for are, and then figure out for your application, for your use case, what do you actually need, what scopes do you actually need to ask for. In this case, um, in our fictional example, Yelp needed access to my Google uh, contacts. So the scopes that they may ask, might ask for are, so let's say, profile contacts. That specific list of scopes that Yelp is asking for is sent along with the authorization request with that initial request over to the authorization server. So I send along some parameters for redirect URI, for the response type, what uh, grant type I want, and also what scopes I want. It's just like a string, a full long string with space delimited list. That list of scopes is then what's used to build the consent screen that the user has to click accept to. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so no, there are in the OAuth 2.0 spec, there is no standard list of scopes or standard naming for scopes. It, all it says is that it's a string, which is kind of annoying because if you were implementing your own, like setting up your own implementation, you would probably want some guidance as far as like what the, the scope name should be. I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to OpenID Connect. But the good news is Google's going to display the description. Totally. Yeah. Well, but yeah, but it has to know the description, right? It does. <laughs> right, yeah, so this is something that what, what scopes are possible, what scopes are available, and what they are called and what they mean is all something that's in the realm of the authorization server. So Google, in this case, has a long list of scopes that you could ask for as a client application. You don't have to worry about like, how it's implemented. You just say, okay, for my app, uh, I need access to your Google Drive or your Google Photos or whatever. I have to find the scopes that apply to that thing whether I need you know, read-only access or read-write access or delete access or whatever. That's all buried in Google's docs somewhere. Um, and then, yeah, you're right. On the, on the authorization so server side, it's totally up to the authorization server to be able to like, map a scope name to some friendly description that they're actually going to display to the user. So, so depending on the room connected to that, might, it might be profile if yeah. I'm talking to Google, but it might, might be account if I'm talking to some other server. Yep, you're absolutely right. Okay. Yep. It's, that's one of the frustrating things, actually, is that there isn't a, a common naming. So if you look at like Google's documentation and Facebook's documentation, they're totally different. 
um, which is good and bad because the types of stuff you can do in Google are very different than the types of stuff you can do in Facebook. So it makes sense to have different types of scopes. Um, if you look at Google's docs, all their scopes or most of their scopes are long like URI style strings. So it's actually like HTTP something, 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 Google slash account slash read slash write or whatever. Which, Yeah, yeah, definitely. So one of the one of the trickiest parts of setting of kind of doing this for the first time or trying to get this working is trying to make sure you have all the right stuff in that initial request. So I'm only showing out of a subset of it. You need redirect URI, you need the scopes, you need the response type, you also need client ID and some other stuff. Um, I'll show you an example of what the full thing looks like, but I'm keeping it simple for now. Um, so let's say that let's say that my fictional application requested the profile scope and the contact scope. And let's say that Google rendered a message to the user saying, are you sure you want to allow Yelp to access your public profile and your contacts? And the user clicked yes. The browser gets redirected back over to the client application with an authorization code. That authorization code carries with it the, the proof that the user clicked yes to that, to that screen and clicked yes to those scopes. And then when the application exchanges that for an access token, that access token itself is scoped down to exactly those operations or exactly those things that were requested at the beginning. Yeah. Why does it send an auth code that you just ship back to get the token? Why not just send me the token? That's a fantastic question. So it looks like we're doing a bunch of extra work, right? It looks like I'm, I got an auth code and then I go immediately back and exchange it. Like, why not cut out that step? That's a fantastic question and I'll answer it in just a sec. Um, but I, what I wanted to point out was that when the, app, the client application goes and talks to the resource server using the access token that we got through this whole flow, even if that access token is totally valid, hasn't expired, all that good stuff, but the client application tries to do something that it wasn't originally scoped for, even a perfectly valid access token will fail. Because the, the resource server, rather, the resource server is going to check a number of things when, it co when a request comes in using an access token. It's going to check, of course, that the access token hasn't been like, totally made up or forged or something. It's going to make sure it hasn't expired. It's still good. But it's also going to make sure it's going to look at the original scopes that are stamped into that access token and check, all right, your scope was profile and contacts. Why are you sending me a request to like delete? You don't have that scope and it would return an error. So scopes are the way that ultimately end up restricting that access token in, in what it's allowed to do. And if, in, for some reason, the client application wanted to get more, more permissions, maybe they initially just wanted to get profile and contacts, but later they want to be able to you know, delete something or send an email or whatever, that would require a new scope. They would have to go back through this whole flow request a new, a longer set of scopes, go back to the authorization server, the user would have to consent to that new one, get a new code, get a new access token, and then that new access token could do, go do more stuff. Is that all making sense so far? All right, so you had a great question about why are we doing this extra exchange step? Why don't I just get the access token right back from the authorization server? Why do I need to do that? Well, there's actually a really good reason. Um, it's a security reason. To, under, to understand why we need to talk about the difference between a back channel and a front channel. These are not strictly OAuth terminology. This is more like network security terminology, I guess. But when we're talking about network security, we can differentiate different types of requests based on how secure they are. Different types of request channels, I guess, based on how secure they are. So let's imagine that your, let's say your backend code, your .NET or Java code or whatever, makes like a post request over HTTPS to some API somewhere. That's pretty secure. Encrypted connection using HTTPS, you know, it's your backend code, so nobody's going to be able to intercept it or whatever, not going through a browser. Um, that would be what we'd consider a back channel. It's really secure. Now, contrast that with a front channel, which is something like a browser. Browsers are pretty secure, but they're not totally secure. Browsers have this annoying loophole where they actually have to render stuff onto the screen. So technically, if you are transmitting something through a browser, like in the, you know, somewhere in the, in the URL 
in the query parameters of a URL, somewhere in the HTML of the page. Technically, if someone was just looking over your shoulder or they have a weird toolbar installed in the browser or something, they could, they could sniff things like what's on the page, what's in the URL bar, things like that. So while browsers should be using HTTPS and all that good stuff, there's still some loopholes where you could potentially intercept something that was sent through a browser. So you'll notice that a number of these steps involved page redirections, where we're doing a get request, put it, putting the browser onto a new location, which loads a new page. And we can send information between different systems that way using just query parameters. We can put something in the, in the query parameters of a request or in the post body of a request, and that goes through the browser. It should be over HTTPS, so that should be secure. But if someone could intercept those query parameters or they intercept that post body or something, they could potentially grab something like your authorization code. So you'll notice, if we take a look at this flow again, all the stuff that's solid lines here are front channel requests. So the initial redirect over to the authorization server that sets up all the, all the stuff, the redirect URI, the response code, the scopes, all that stuff, that all is just a get request that has query parameters. That's how we send all that stuff over to the authorization server. And technically, maybe somebody could intercept that some weird browser plugin could intercept that or whatever, malware on the machine could see that. But if somebody saw that request, it would, wouldn't really be a whole lot of harm done. They know that we're asking for these scopes, they know that we wanna end up at this redirect URI, but like, we're gonna end up there in a second anyway, it's not gonna be really any uh, secret information. You'll notice that the authorization code also comes back over a front channel, that's just a post or a get with something in the query parameter or something in the fragment. So that also could technically be intercepted. Maybe someone could grab that authorization code and try to like get an access token with it before we get an access token with it. Maybe, technically. But the very next step that happens, happens not on the front channel, but on the back channel. So when the client application gets that authorization code and it has to go back up to the authorization server to exchange it for an access token, that exchange step happens on the, on the back end code, it happens on a back channel. So that's like a post request from Yelp servers up to Google in this fictional example. It's important to know that there's, to, to say that there's also a, a secret that goes along with that. Very true. So it is very important to know that there's also a secret, like a password that goes along with that. I'll show you that in a sec when I show you like the full raw request. But there, in, in addition to the authorization code, which technically maybe could be seen somewhere in the browser, there's also a secret value what's called a client secret that's sent up with that exchange step that proves that that application is who they say they are. And we don't ever send that client secret over the browser, which for, for security reasons. You'll notice also that the communication between the application and the resource server is usually also only on the front channel. So we keep that, once we have an access token, we try to keep that really private, keep it only on the server and do our best not to let it be on the client anywhere. There are some exceptions to that, which I'll talk about in a sec. But this is what the initial request would actually look like. This is like the full version of the initial request. This is what, if you look at the destination URL of a, of a button, like the Facebook login button or connect with Google button or whatever, this is what, what it would look like. It starts out with some URL on the authorization server. That's accounts.google.com slash something, something, something. And we have to send along a bunch of stuff to kind of bootstrap or set up the request. I mentioned already the redirect URI and the scopes and the response type. Um, there's also a client ID, which you mentioned before. The client ID is just a value that represents this particular application, this client, as opposed to some other client. So the authorization server knows who's calling, who's, who's starting this request. And there's some other stuff you can send along here. Sometimes you send a state, which is just a value that goes all the way through the, the dance and comes back the other side. Question? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't skip past the implicit flow because I hate it. I just skipped past it because I haven't gotten there quite yet. Okay. Um, but I'm really glad you asked because we will talk about the implicit flow. Um, so this, uh, I wanted to show you one other thing here, if I can switch gears and it doesn't hate me too much. All right. So 
if you have ever set up any type of integration with Google, for example, then you've probably seen this. This uh, this panel that lets you set up a set of credentials for your application. Anybody gone through this before? Maybe. Okay. So this is the same. You got to do the same thing with Facebook or Twitter or any other OAuth system that you're connecting with, even non-social network ones. <laughs> um, but the idea here is that you have to do a one a, a bit of one-time setup on the authorization server before you can kick off one of these requests. You have to create what's called a client ID and a client secret. The client ID represents the fact that you are connecting, Yelp or somebody is connecting to this authorization server. And then the client secret is a value, kind of like a password, that you keep secure on the server and you never give out to anybody. Because that's what, you, that's what is used to authenticate or prove that connection when you go do the exchange step. Um, so I mentioned before, somebody asked a question about um, all the different stuff you have to set up in the request just to kind of get the first request working. And that turns out to be like one of the hardest parts of doing OAuth correctly. It's just like really hard to, um, to get it working the first time. So I built a little tool that can help with that. It's called the OAuth debugger. If you want to just hit like OAuthDebugger.com. What this tool lets you do is you punch in like the, the authorization URI that the authorization server uses, which you can find in their documentation. You punch in your redirect URI, you put your client ID in there, you put the scopes in there, all the stuff you need and then it creates the correct URL for you and lets you try it out. I built this only because I had been doing it by hand like so many times I got so frustrated that I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. So I built this little tool. Um, but I'll use it to show you kind of what it looks like. So you imagine that we set up a request against the Google authorization server, just the same exact type of request that I was showing in the slides. Let me see if I can make this bigger. All right, so this is the base URL that the Google authorization server uses. It's different for any other OAuth authorization server. And I have a client ID that I set up a long time ago for demo purposes. That's my client in Google. Let's ask for the profile, say, email scopes. Now, profile contacts, just like the, just like the example. And then I say that I want a Authorization code back. That was the response type I asked for. And it's going to come back in the query string. This is the full URL that you would need to generate in your application to make that work. You can copy it if you want. And then let's try it out. If I didn't make any mistakes, oh, oh, contact is not actually the real scope that Google uses. Let's just say profile. You can see how this will work. So it didn't actually ask me to log in at Google because I'm already logged in in this Chrome session. But you can imagine what it did in that 200 milliseconds or so. It actually redirected my browser over to Google, knew I was already logged in, so it immediately redirected back. And I got an authorization code. This is what my authorization code looks like. Now, then, of course, the next step is that my client, my application, would need to take that authorization code, exchange it for an access token, and then it could make some calls with that access token. I can't actually do the exchange step here on this tool because then you'd have to give me your client secret and that would be really bad. So I'll show you in the slides instead. Yeah. Just because you were logged in, how does it know that it's okay to give you the profile? Ah, great question. I glossed over that, sorry. I've already logged into Google and I've already done this demo before and I've already clicked accept to that scope. <laughs> so it didn't ask me again. If I did this in an incognito window or on an, another Google account, it would have asked me. Another Google account, not an incognito window. Or I could go into my account and disconnect this application and revoke it or whatever and then try again. So what is the guideline for storing the authorization code on the server side? You should not store the authorization code on the server side. Because if, the, if there are multiple authorization servers, then how is the authorization server able to store it? Uh, well, the reason I say you shouldn't store the authorization code is because the authorization code is very short-lived and should only be used to go get the token. But if there are load balancers and then if it hits to another instance of the authorization server, how does that server mm. know anything about this code? If it's load balanced and one server doesn't know about the code but another one does, that's a very interesting edge case that I would love to talk about with you afterwards. That, that sh I think the short answer is that shouldn't happen because you should 
all the servers should know about it behind the scenes. Unless you store that store somewhere, right? So that all the instances know about it. Instances of, are you talking about instances of the client or the authorization server? Are you are you running are you running your own authorization server? Yeah, I'm running my own authorization gotcha. server. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, cache building. Storing your cache. Some guidelines like that. Probably like uh, there are a lot of guidelines about what is okay for guidelines. That's that okay, I understand the question now. That's a good question. Um, actually this is the guy you want to talk to because I know more about it from the client side. He wrote the book on doing it from the server side. So, uh, Mr. Aaron Parecki, uh, I will introduce him to you afterwards. Okay, so I showed this already in the demo in the, in the application, but basically the authorization server will redirect back over to the client in one of two states. Either in an error state, because the, the user clicked, no, I do not accept this permission, or maybe you like messed up the parameters in some way and it didn't work, like the first time I tried it. Either you'll get redirected back with an error, so you have some error message that you can display, or you'll get redirected back in a success state, and you'll get the code that you asked for, and then whatever state you, you sent along at the beginning. Um, then, of course, the next step is to exchange that code for an access token. So that means going back up to the authorization server. This is now not happening in the browser. This is a post request from the backend code up to the authorization server on a different URL saying, hey, okay, I get, you just gave me this code, here's the code, here's that client ID that I sent before, here's also the client secret that we haven't sent before. This client secret is what I got when I initially set up my application with the authorization server. And that client secret hasn't, hasn't left my server. I didn't put it in the browser, I didn't publish it on GitHub, hopefully. Um, <laughs> we've all been there. Um, so if, if I send all this stuff up to the authorization server and the authorization code hasn't expired or like isn't tampered with or something, or hopefully it's not swallowed by a load balancer or something, what happens is I get back, finally at the client application, I get back an access token. That access token is just some string. In the OAuth spec, it doesn't say what format the string should be in or how it should be in some token format or something. It just says it's a string. The client should treat it as just an opaque value that's a magic value, doesn't know anything about it. And also some expiration information, like how long it's good for, things like that. Now, the client can finally go make requests to the resource server with that authorization, um, with that access token, rather. We use the HTTP auth authorization, I'm going to get this all tongue-tied, the HTTP authorization header with the word bearer and then the access token. Sometimes these are called bearer tokens because of that word bearer there. And basically what's happening is this. You can imagine at a high level the client's making a request to some API and it's attaching that token to the request. On the API side, the API, the resource server, or the API is responsible for validating the token, making sure it hasn't expired, making sure that the client just didn't make it up. And then also, like I mentioned before, making sure that it actually has the scope to do the thing that the client is trying to do. So if I have a token that is scoped for you know, read-only access and I'm trying to do some write or some delete, it should say, tell me no. Assuming that all those checks check out, then this particular request is authorized, it's approved. And then if the client needs to make another request, this whole thing has to go again. We use that same token, we make another request, and that next request would be approved. This could happen you know, 10 times, 100 times, a million times. At some point, the access token will expire and the client will have to go get another one from the authorization server. Turns out it's not too hard to go get another one because we can just go back through that OAuth dance, get a new authorization code, get a new access token, and we have a fresh one that we can go assuming that the user hasn't, in the, in the meantime, rejected my, my permissions or rejected that approval for my application. Okay, so we kind of went down into the weeds with the OAuth 2.0 authorization code flow. That's what we're looking at there. There are some other flows, as you mentioned. We also have something called the implicit flow, which is available if we don't have a back channel available. I was kind of mentioning how that authorization code uses both the back channel and the front channel together. The front channel is really easy to pass stuff back and forth through the browser. Then we use the back channel to just kind of add some additional security to it to make sure that we don't send the client secret over the browser, for example. 
So the authorization code flow is a really good balance between the front channel and the back channel. The implicit flow is front channel only, which means it never has any back channel communication. Um, and that's slightly less secure, or depending on who you're asking, very much less secure, um, because we don't have that assurance of having a back channel connection, and we also don't use the client secret. But it's available for situations where you just don't have a back channel available. And a good example of that would be many times if you have like a pure Angular app or a pure React app, some JavaScript application that's totally running in the browser, you're making requests to an API with it, but you don't have any backend code that's you know, rendering the page, you don't actually have a good back channel available. And so a lot of times people use the implicit flow there. The implicit flow and refresh tokens. No. No, Aaron's shaking his head at me. It doesn't. I always forget about that one. I have to look it up every time. Um, I haven't really talked about refresh tokens yet, but I can later if you're interested. There's a couple other flows. Anybody using the um, resource owner password flow? Maybe, kind of. The resource owner password credentials flow is a back channel only flow, which is usually used. It's not used a ton anymore. Um, but it's available if you just want to post the user's like username and password directly and get a token without going through this redirect back and forth. Um, also, the client credentials flow is a, another back channel only flow that's used for like machine to machine communication a lot of times. But the first two are the, the most common uses of OAuth 2.0 on the web. Just because you asked about it, the implicit flow, I'll, go, I'll kind of show you what that looks like real quick. The implicit flow looks exactly like the authorization code flow except instead of response type code, I ask for a response type token. That means I'm not getting a code back in this redirect back step. I'm not getting a code back, I'm getting the actual access token directly back, which means that I don't have that exchange step. I don't technically have that assurance that the, the uh, token wasn't intercepted somewhere by someone you know, like sniffing it out of the URL. Um, but it does help you get around the fact that like in a spa, you don't necessarily have a back channel available. Okay, so let's jump back in our time machine and fast forward a couple years. We started out in 2007. Then, say like five, six years later, this OAuth 2.0 thing became really popular. It ended up being so popular that it was kind of a victim of its own success in a way. As I mentioned before, OAuth 2.0 was built for this author authorization, kind of delegating permissions between systems. That's what it was built for. That's what the protocol is built around. That's what the, the protocol is meant for. But because it was so popular and everybody started using it, it became very tempting to also use it for authentication. So not just for the delegated authorization stuff, but for login on native apps, single sign-on type stuff, even just like the simple login. The big thing that kind of pushed OAuth 2.0 into the mainstream for authentication, not authorization, was social login. So around this time, Facebook introduced the idea of the Facebook login button, which at the time was a kind of a new idea. It's like half step inside the single sign-on thing, but it's also a little bit of a different thing itself, where you have an account with one of the big networks like Facebook or Google or LinkedIn or whatever, and you can use that account to log in on other sites where you don't want to necessarily have to make a new password every time. You just hit that Facebook login button, you get access to that new site. That's authentication, not authorization. That's not what OAuth was originally built for. Part of the reason why it's so confusing to understand OAuth and read any of the stuff people write about OAuth on the web is because half the time they're talking about using it for the original thing that it was built for, which is authorization, and half the time they're using it for authentication and talking about it in this context where it's like not really meant to be used. Now, that's, that's unfortunately more confusing than it should be, and I think Facebook and Google and the big guys who decided to do this, kind of share a little bit of the blame for making it more confusing than it should be. Um, the reason why I say that OAuth 2.0 is not good for authentication is not just like an academic argument. Um, there's some specific things that we've kind of already talked about a little bit. Um, I mentioned that there's no common set of scope names, so every OAuth 2.0 implementation is a little bit different. Um, the big reason, though, why OAuth 2.0 kind of sucks for, for authentication is that there's no common way of getting the user's information in OAuth 2.0. OAuth, like I said, is all about authorization. It cares about what permissions you have. It cares about scopes. It cares about tokens. It doesn't really care who you are necessarily. So imagine you're building an authentication system. Somebody logs into your site. 
you'd imagine that probably the first thing you want to know is like who just logged in. Maybe like what's their name, what's their email address, some basic stuff like that. But OAuth doesn't have like an endpoint or a part of the protocol that ex describes getting the user's info. So when Facebook and Microsoft and Google and LinkedIn and everybody built their social login buttons, each one of them built some proprietary kind of hack on top of OAuth 2.0 that you can get the user's info. On Facebook, it was like a slash me route that you could call with the access token and get some user info with that. It looked a little bit different for Google. Microsoft called it something a little bit different. And when you have a standard that's being used in many different interesting ways like that, it becomes really difficult to use. And it just wasn't meant for authentication in the first place. So to solve that problem, some smart people went back to the table and said, well, this OAuth 2.0 thing has really caught on. It's like a big internet standard now, but people are now using it for authentication. Why don't we just make a new protocol that already kind of takes all the stuff we learned from OAuth 2.0 and just make it really nice for authentication too? That's where we got OpenID Connect. So I said new protocol, but that's actually a misnomer. OpenID Connect is not a new protocol. It's just a pretty thin little extension on top of OAuth 2.0 that just adds the stuff you would need for authentication and also tightens up some of the stuff like that scopes can be whatever you want and makes it a little bit narrower so that each implementation is a, starts looking a lot more standard. So specifically to, to close the gap for that authentication use case, OpenID Connect adds this idea of an ID token. So just like OAuth 2.0, we're getting an access token that, that can be used to call APIs or whatever, but we also get in, OAuth, in OpenID Connect an ID token which just has the info about the user, their identity information in it. And if that ID token doesn't have enough information in it, the application wants more for some reason, there's a special endpoint called slash user info that the application can call and get more info about the user. And like I said, it also just standardizes some of the scopes and makes the implementations a little bit tighter so that if you have a system that says, I support OpenID Connect, I'm OpenID Connect certified, and your client is also OpenID Connect certified, they can talk to each other very easily. And you don't have to worry about some like, minor differences in the implementation like you do with OAuth. So let me show you what it looks like to authenticate with OpenID Connect. Now we're actually talking about logging in. We're not talking about getting permissions in another system. So instead of like authorize with Google, maybe it says log in with Google. Pretty much all this flow is going to look exactly the same because it's not a new protocol. It's just OAuth 2.0 plus this little bit of extra bit called OpenID Connect. The actual only real difference here is you'll notice a new scope called OpenID. That OpenID scope tells the authorization server if it's an OpenID Connect compliant authorization server, if it understands OpenID Connect, that tells the authorization server that this is going to be, this is an authentication request. I want an ID token at the end of the day, not just an access token. The rest of it looks exactly the same. Get an authorization code from the other side, exchange that authorization code for an access token and an ID token this time. That ID token can then be used by the client application to immediately understand who the user is, maybe create a local session for the user or put the user's information in the local database or whatever makes sense there. And then the access token can still be used to go back up to the authorization server or to a resource server somewhere, for example, to get more of the user's information. Let me show you. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that's somewhat up to the authorization server's discretion. I haven't tried it with every one of them. I know with, with Google, I think OpenID implies profile, so you'd at least have to grant access to your public profile in order to do that. Let me show you an example of what OpenID Connect looks like. I have a, another version of this tool called OIDC Debugger, OpenID Connect Debugger, which as you might expect does the exact same thing for OpenID Connect. So my company, Okta, lets you run an OpenID Connect authorization server like in the cloud and totally manages it for you so you don't have to worry about the details of the implementation. So I have one of those. I have an OpenID Connect authorization server running that's custom, that's built by me, not really by me, built by Okta. Uh, 
and I have set it up with a client ID for this application. I'm going to request the open ID scope. And instead of, I'm actually going to use the implicit flow here because I want to end up with a token. Instead of the code, I'm going to request an ID token. And let's see how this works. This time I have to log in. OK, so I had to log in over at the authorization server. Once I logged in, I got sent back to my application with what I asked for, which in this case was an ID token. That ID token looks like this. It's a long string, just like the access token is. In the ID token's case, it's actually a very specific type of string. Unlike OAuth 2.0, where the string is just like an opaque value, in OpenID Connect, the ID token has to be what's called a JSON web token or a JWT. And that means that I can decode it very easily with a tool like JSONWebToken.io. Blow this one up too. So I can just paste this in. All it is is a, oops. All it is is a base64 encoded JSON object, JSON blob. So it looks something like this. I know that's kind of small, but it has um, some information about me. It has like my user ID. It has the time I logged in. It has the time the, the token expires, the authorization server that granted the token, some info that my application can understand. Bless you. Let's get past this. Okay, anybody here worked with JSON web tokens before? It's pretty common. Yeah, especially if you're like in the node world, it's really common there. Um, a JSON web token, like I said, is just a base64 encoded JSON object. If you take a JSON object, serialize it to a string, and then put that through a base64 encoder, you have a JSON web token. It's made up of three different parts that are separated by a period. If you look really closely, you can see a period in any JSON web token, two periods actually. Um, those three parts are a header, a payload, or a body, and a signature. So aside from carrying some information, some, some JSON information, JSON web tokens, or specifically JSON signed JSON web tokens, also carry a signature, which is a cryptographic hash of the contents of the token. What that allows us to do is be able to verify that the token has not been tampered with even without having to go back to the authorization server to make sure the token is still valid. So I can say, the token claims to have this signature. Let me just look at the information in the token and make sure it matches that signature. If it does, I know that the token has not been tampered with. If it doesn't, something funny happened. Somebody tried to mess with the token, edit their, uh, their role or something like that. If anybody's curious about how that um, signing process works, I can, I can go into it more. But I wanted to show you what it looks like if you decode, kind of what I did on that tool just now. If you decode just the payload portion, you see something like this. And that's base64 encoding. It's not encryption. So it's not like it's being encoded for secrecy. It's just being encoded so it doesn't have any weird characters. It's like very you know, network friendly to send over the wire in a header or something like that. So it looks something like this. You get information about the user, when they log in, when this token is going to expire, things like that. And then, like I said, if you want more information about the user, then you can take the access token that you also got through the OpenID Connect flow and go up and call this special endpoint called the user info endpoint and get some more information about the user. And that's usually stuff like, again, the user's name, but depending on the authorization server, it might also be like their profile picture or whatever the authorization server wants to send you. So if we take our time machine from 2012-ish all the way up to today, now we can see that things are settling out like a lot better. So the way the industry is kind of moving towards is using OpenID Connect as kind of a standard glue, a standard protocol for doing a lot of authentication use cases. You can use it for like the simple login stuff, for single sign-on stuff if you don't want to do SAML. You can use it really well for mobile authentication. Um, and then you would still use, if you need to do the delegated authorization use cases, you would still use OAuth 2.0. That's still the best tool for that job. But at least now we're using like authentication protocols for authentication and authorization protocols for authorization. Now, some people get confused because they've probably heard of like both of these things, but they've heard that OpenID Connect is newer, and so they think maybe it replaces OAuth 2.0, um, or one is better than the other. But I just wanted to stress that these are two different tools for different jobs. So if you're doing authentication, logging in, or letting people log in to you, that's OpenID Connect. If you're doing authorization, granting access, dealing with permissions, things like that, that's OAuth 2.0. 
And it, it's fairly common to see both of these used in the same, in the same application, just for different, different parts of the application. So they live side by side perfectly fine. One does not replace the other. Um, if you're doing OAuth stuff or OpenID Connect stuff, one thing that is, can be kind of hard to wrap your head around at first is what, what flow, what grant type is the best to use in a particular situation. And right now it seems to be the current best practice that for web applications with server backends that can run backend code that have a back channel available, then the authorization code flow is the best way to go. That has a really good amount of security built into it. Ditto for mobile applications. You can use the authorization code flow on mobile apps as well. You have to use this additional extension called Pixie or proof key for code exchange that patches specific vulnerabilities in that only exist in mobile operating systems. Um, so you can use that really well for mobile apps. I mentioned before that if you have a single page app with no back channel available, then you can use the implicit flow. Um, and then for like microservices, APIs, things like that, you can use what's called the client credentials flow to get a token in an automated way. So you can make like API calls in the middle of the night or something like that. Um, I wanted to show a couple of, oh, sorry, question, yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't have an example of client credentials in this deck, in this uh, presentation. But the way the client credentials flow works is it's just, just a post request. Post to the authorization server with like a key in secret, and you get a token back. And it is usually not in the context of, of on behalf of a user. It's usually in the context of like machine to machine um, communication. So you might have a, let's say that you have an automated service, automated job that runs every night or something, you generate a key in secret for that application, and then it can go get tokens totally without a user ever clicking yes or authorizing anything. Um, just to illustrate the examples that I was just talking about, the different like flows, if you're, use, if you're building a web application with a, that has a backend server, you know, ASP.NET, Spring, whatever you want, and you're doing authentication, if you want to kind of pull apart the authentication mechanism or the identity mechanism from the application and not have to have those living in the same application, then you can push the login process or the authentication bits over to an authorization server and then just use OpenID Connect as the glue between your application and then whatever identity system you're using. You see this commonly happens when, especially when you have applications that end up being a suite of applications and you need to do single sign-on between them. This is exactly how Google does it. They have accounts.google.com as their like authorization server, their authentication mechanism, and all the different Google products use that. And then each application then is setting their own like local session or something to keep track of the user, but they're relying on the authorization server to actually do the login and grant those tokens. Yeah. It, at the exa uh, exactly the same place. So if you're doing OpenID Connect and you want an ID token, when you do the exchange, you post the authorization code up to the authorization server. Instead of just getting an access token back, you get an access token and an ID token at the same time. That's the only difference with OpenID Connect. That's a good question. Anybody else have any questions? I've been talking for a while. It is. It is, yeah. So when, when you set up the initial request and you say, here's my scopes, here's the grant type that I want, here's the redirect URI that I want you to come back to, that also has to be something that's registered in advance. Exactly. You have to agree on, agree on it in advance. The reason you have to do that is just an additional security measure. That's so that somebody can't um, set up like a very convincing phishing site that that starts off the flow but then says, no, come back over here when you're done and, and try to steal those tokens. The authorization server has to pre, basically like pre-approve the redirect URIs that the user will end up on. There was another question. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Typically, you would have separate client IDs for like dev pro staging prod, most likely, yeah. You can, might be able to use the same authorization server. So we're t you're talking about registering a user account. Yes. Gotcha. Um, so unfortunately, OpenID Connect has absolutely nothing to say about user registration. So that would have to be something that's like that's out of band of OpenID Connect. But OpenID Connect needs to have that information registered with it somehow. The, the user has to be registered with the authorization server in some way, yes. So there's no standard way to do that? Not that I'm aware of. Sign out? Yeah, like, you know, user want to click, okay, I'm done with application, want to sign out. Yeah. Is there a way to send a request to the server that you pull it out to There is, there is. Let me show you, um, let me skip back a couple of slides. Let me show you something that's kind of cool. So the question was, um, is there a way, I understand how we can sign in, but what about signing out? One sec. So I mentioned that I had an, authoriz an OpenID Connect authorization server running up in the cloud via Okta. And that, because it's an OpenID Connect server, something that all OpenID Connect servers have is something called a metadata document or a discovery document. This is available on a very specific URL of the authorization server. And it's just a big JSON document that has a bunch of info in it that tells you what all the different URLs are that you need to do to use if you want to like start a request, if you want to do the token exchange, if you want to get user info. This discovery document is one of the other things that OpenID Connect adds that makes it a lot easier to build kind of a standard reference implementation of OpenID Connect. An OpenID basically. It's kind of like a WSDL, lighter, cleaner, more hipster, it's JSON. Um, what this allows you to do is take a client, just a generic OpenID Connect client, point it at this authorization server. The very first thing it's going to do is see if it has one of these discovery documents. And if it does, the client is able to kind of bootstrap itself and understand, okay, when someone wants to log in, I'm going to hit that authorization endpoint right there. Now, to answer your question about logging out, if we scroll all the way down to the bottom here, there's something called the end session endpoint. And that does exactly what you're asking about. That would be if I want to log the user out, I want to kill their session at the authorization server, I can redirect them through that end session endpoint and they would be logged out. Bless you. So there's an interesting, there's kind of an interesting nuance here because if you are, oops, wrong slide. If you're building an application that's using an OpenID Connect authoriza authorization server for authentication, that's, that's a mouthful. You kind of have, you end up having two sessions going on that are tracked separately. You end up having a session over on the authorization server, like the user is logged in at the authorization server. And then you also have a local session in your application that's probably like a cookie or something that you're dropping in the user's browser, just like you would with like forms authentication. Um, so there's, there's some nuance there as far as when the user logs out, are they logging out of just the local application or are they also logging out of the authorization server? And that, it depends. Um, because sometimes maybe you have one application and one authorization server and they're basically just the, whole, the same like application. But you also might have like something like Google has where they have all their different applications using the same authorization server kind of for like a single sign-on type of situation. And in that case, you have to be very, you kind of have to think about what, if someone logs out, does that, do you want them to be logged out of all the applications at the same time, like killing their session across all apps, or are you just logging out of this one? Um, if you want to log out of all, then you would go through that end session endpoint that kills the session at the authorization server level. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Any other questions? I know there were a couple other hands. Yeah. Um, back to your registration. Sure. Everyone has their own, but you said that there was a preflex or a 
standardization, what standardization has been done, or the fact that it just exists? In terms of your, um, you're wondering if, is there a standardization in terms of what data is returned from the user info endpoint, if I call that user info endpoint? Well, maybe the protocol for handling. That ID token will always be the same token for that, for that, per, for that person who logged into the Google account. They'll always get back that same ID token. Not quite. The ID token would actually be different every time because it has stuff like the timestamp they logged in. So, well, one of those tokens. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, it it so would I be. Have to go back, I have to go to the other to get the user information in order to get the user information that's specific to that user. It, they would both both the ID token and the user info endpoint would have information about the user. The, well, the ID token is the ID token isn't like a um, a permanent representation of the user. It's not like a, a GUID that represents the user, but it would usually contain something like that. So it would contain a user ID. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you wouldn't. You typically would not store the ID token for a long period of time. You might. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're if you're talking about uh, being able to do essentially like a foreign key between your your system and the identity system, then you would you would look for the user ID in the ID token. I can't remember if that's a standard claim or not. Subject, right? I think it's subject. The subject. That's that's what it is. Subject. So the way the one of the standard claims that all ID tokens will always have, and the user info response will always have as well, is a SUB or sub claim, which stands for subject which is a, an identifier for the user. Sometimes it's like an email address, sometimes it's a random string, but it's something that uniquely identifies the user. Does that kind of answer your question? Correct. Yeah. So I, I know what you're asking about. Think about think about OpenID Connect as the the common like I think of it as like the glue between an application and the login system. How the data got there is kind of irrelevant to OpenID Connect. The data under the under the hood, that data could be could be in a SQL database, it could be in an Excel file, it could be in Oracle or whatever. But OpenID Connect is kind of a common layer that if everybody speaks that, then we can at least get somebody logged in. But there has to be a bootstrapping <coughs> so that I can initially associate um, an account in my system to a, a, an account in that authentication, author, you know, authentication system, right? And so it might, might, it might be a link like you're saying, an invitation. And so I send you an invitation, which gives me to this thing, and then I click, I want to connect this with Google now, and then now you, just, now you establish that relationship. Yeah, that's that's actually a little bit more complicated use case. That would be um, something like account linking, where you could link an existing account with. That's what we're talking about. You have to link. If, if I have my if I have my thing I'm writing, and I want to be able to authorize this Google. Before I can authorize this thing with Google, I need to be have something that I can present a claim that I can present to say, say this is the thing I want to link with Google. Right? Um, it sounds like you're talking about an application that already has local user accounts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in that case, you would you would need to have some way of, of linking that local account to the the identity somewhere else. It may be a user account. It may be a list of. It may be a list of. Uh, I, I've got a system potentially with a list of users and email addresses. Now, if a user comes in tomorrow, and says, I, you know, I know about this person, and, and I want to be able to send him an invitation um, and, and have him author. I don't know, trip it, for instance. Yes. I want to add. I want to add this person. Gotcha. To, as a viewer. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, what happens is I send them an invitation. They send right. an invitation. Now I can link that invitation with whatever authorization I want to use. And yeah. So forth. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There's there's different ways that you can handle that. Um, usually, it, it usually it involves if you have some row in your local database, you can uh, you know have a column that that connects to that subclaim that you know is referring to the user on the remote system. 
that's one way to do it. Sometimes in some situations, you don't have any local user table at all. You just know that you're trusting completely the, the remote system is your you know, source of identities. Um, that would be more like maybe you'd have a totally greenfield application that you set up from the beginning with OpenID Connect and you just treat, maybe you are running your own authorization server and you treat the identities coming from that authorization server as your real identities in the application. There's, there's different ways you can do that. Uh, more questions? I'll get to you next. Ah, I didn't, um, I didn't call it that, but I did talk about that before. Uh, I don't really have a slide that talks about it, but um, so I think what you're referring to is when you have an access token that's not a JSON web token, it's just some opaque string. Right. right. So there's different ways of handling access tokens. In the, o in the OAuth 2.0 spec, not talking about OpenID Connect, but just base OAuth 2.0, the access token is just a string. And it is sometimes referred to as a reference token. The reason it's referred to as a reference token is because that string doesn't mean anything to me as the client. I can't decode it. I can't do anything with it. All, what I can do with it is just send it over to the authorization server and, or use it in request to the resource server, or I can send it to the authorization server and ask, hey, is this token still valid? It's called a reference token because it is just referencing some state on the authorization server. The, the token itself is stored in some database on the authorization server where there's like a, you know, is still valid true column or an expiration column or whatever. You can contrast that to what's called a stateless token, which is a token that isn't stored on the authorization server. It is set up with an expiration time and information and, an, and a signature that's all baked into the token like a JSON web token where the server, the authorization server, actually doesn't have to keep track of the token anymore. It doesn't like save it in a database somewhere. It just trusts the cryptographic signing that's used on the token to ensure that it wasn't tampered with. Um, this, that involves how you deal with token validation. So let's say that you are dealing with tokens. Maybe you're running a resource server and the requests coming into your um, to your API have tokens attached to them, authorization bearer and then some access token. You have to make sure that that token is still valid, hasn't been tampered with or forged or made up or whatever. So there's basically two ways of validating a token. You can always do the second one, which is called introspection. Token introspection is where you take that whole access token and you send it over to the authorization server and say, hey, authorization server, is this token still good? and the authorization server responds with either you know, true or false. That is a really strong way of token validation because you're trusting the source of the access token, which is the authorization server, to validate it for you. But it, of course, requires a network request, so it could introduce some latency. There's a faster way of doing token validation, which is what's called local validation. If the token is not a reference token, but is a stateless token, you could validate it, the client could validate it themselves by checking the signature on the token. This, that only applies if the token is a JSON web token. As I mentioned before, in OAuth 2.0, it's not guaranteed that the token would be a JSON web token. In OpenID Connect, it is guaranteed that the ID token is a JSON web token. Um, that gets kind of complicated, but the, the, the difference, I guess, the to boil it down really far, the difference between a stateless token and a reference token is that one, you have to go talk to the authorization server about. The other one, you could potentially, if it's stateless, you could potentially validate it yourself. Does that kind of answer your question? I think a reference token offers an advantage because once the token is issued and the user is disabled in the system, application can still use the uh, actual token, right? And if the reference token is there, then we can avoid that the edge condition where sure. Yeah, yeah. So that that is that's a really good thing. What he's talking about, you're talking about token revocation, being able to say like a token was issued, but then at some point either the user they logged out, they got compromised, they got fired, whatever, something happened, and we don't want them to be able to make requests anymore. 
Um, if, if you're using totally stateless tokens, you're just trusting the signature and the expiration time on the token as your validation mechanism, then you, the best you could do is just hope that the token expires soon. That's it, because you're just trusting the token based on its expiration time and signature. If you are using tokens that are tracked on the authorization server, reference tokens, then that means that your requests are a little slower because you have to go over to the authorization server every time and check to make sure that they're still valid. But that gives you the additional benefit of being able to you know, cut off a token before it expires by revoking it. Um, that would look something like this. You could like post over to a revocation endpoint and say, hey, this token that is still good right now, I want you to stop, stop it, cut it off. This is really common. Um, you'll see this on the user side in systems like Facebook and Google where you can um, say, hey, my account was compromised and like disconnect all my mobile devices, shut all that access down. Under the hood, that's all it's doing. It's just revoking a bunch of tokens. Yeah. You had a question? Um, somebody else had a question earlier. It was about token refresh, I think. Oh, yeah. Have you already covered that? It's not important. No, I actually have not covered token refresh. As you, as you can see, this topic starts out like nice and clean on the high level and then it gets in this huge rabbit hole that you can go like a million years on in every direction. Um, token, <laughs> yeah, exactly. token refresh is another thing that, that a lot of people talk about. So the idea here is that we've been talking about going through the OAuth flow, the OAuth dance and getting an access token. There's another mode in which you could get an access token and also something called a refresh token. Now, the refresh token would be used if your access token expires, but you want the user to still be able to do stuff. You want to get a new access token. So you can use that refresh token to get a new access token really fast. Um, now, this, is, this part gets a little bit confusing. And this, like, I was confused about this for a long time. The, the normal way, let's say the normal way of getting a new token if your token expires, let's say that, let's say your authorization server has tokens, issues tokens that last for 30 minutes. So your access token is good for API calls for 30 minutes. At 29 minutes, you can still make as many API calls as you want. At 31 minutes, they're gonna start coming back 401 unauthorized, that token expired. So the normal way you could get a new access token is you would just send the user's browser through that flow again over to the authorization server, request you know, response type code, get a new authorization code, exchange the authorization code for an access token. You got a fresh access token, new 30 minutes, you can keep making as many requests as you want. Now, it, you would think that, or that might sound like it would take a long time to go through that flow again, but if the user's already accepted those scopes and they still have a session on the authorization server, it takes like 200 milliseconds or like really fast. You actually saw it happen when I showed you my demo where I was supposed to, it was supposed to ask me to log into Google, but it never did. It just came right back with a code like immediately. That was because I was already, I was still logged in and, and that's exactly what happened. So that's how you could get an, a new access token the normal way. Now, if in certain situations, let's say that maybe you don't have the user's browser anymore to be able to do that. If that's your situation, then you can use what's called a refresh token to do that process in like an automated way. So a good example of this would be, let's say that I authorize you to you know, have access to my account because um, <coughs> let's say uh, there was a service, let's say I'm running a service that looks at your email every night like cleans up all the semi-junk mail that you like probably don't want to read, but maybe you want to read and it puts it all in like one folder. And it's supposed to do that every night at midnight. Well, the initial way that I gave you access to my account was I, you know, connected to my Gmail account. I clicked allow, give you scope to re read access or actually rewrite access to my email. And you got a token, your application got a token to do that. And that token lasts a week. And every night at midnight, you've been running that cleanup job. And I'm really happy as a user because I don't see all the spam from the newsletters I forgot I signed up for or whatever. Now, after that token expires after a week, now what are you going to do? You can't run that job anymore at night because I'm not, the user's not around to let you go back through the browser and, and potentially click accept again or probably wouldn't have to click accept again. But at least you don't have a browser anymore to go through that flow again. So what you do then is 
you request one extra scope at the very beginning, a scope usually called offline underscore access. If you request that offline access scope during the code exchange, you exchange that code like normal, you get an access token like normal, you also get a refresh token. You hold on to that refresh token, and all that refresh token is all the refresh token is good for is getting a new access token programmatically once the first one expires. So typically the access token might last, maybe say that lasts for a week, the refresh token lasts for a year. When that access token expires, I'm like, hey, I got a refresh token. I'll go send up the refresh token, get a new access token. I don't have to bother the user. I don't have to send the user's browser through that, through that flow again. So I can just keep getting access tokens as long as I want until the refresh token expires. And then once that happens, then I really have to like bug the user to reauthorize my application. Um, that was a pattern that was used a lot by um, mobile apps and by like integrations with Google. A lot of times uh, authorization servers will just make the refresh tokens last like 10 years or something. I think that was Facebook's choice for their app because they just didn't want to bug you about logging in all the time. I, I don't think that's a great idea to have them last for 10 years because that's like a, I don't know, there's security implications to that, but um, that's how the refresh token mechanism works. Does that kind of make sense? Some nods, but that could be people nodding to sleep. So um, any other questions? Gone pretty far down the rabbit hole now. That's good. Yeah. So the refresh token is there. Does it have any format or is it just a string? Just a string. Just a string. At least from the client's point of view, the client should just, just treat it as a string. Um, it maybe, maybe it might be like a JSON web token under the hood, but the client shouldn't assume that. So the expiration is tracked in the authorization server. The expiration is tracked in the authorization server, yeah. So there's, an, there's kind of an interesting nuance here that took me a while to understand, which is if you're using the normal way, the way that I described where to get a new access token, you send the user's browser back over to the authorization server and it bounces back immediately. The reason why that is good or that has some advantages is because what it, in, what it forces you to do is basically check back in with the authorization server. Make sure the user still has a session over there on the authorization server. And assuming they do, they get back really fast. Um, the refresh token kind of does the same thing. It makes you go back up to the authorization server with that refresh token, but then with a refresh token, it means that there's like another thing that you have to revoke if something goes bad. If, you, if the user gets compromised, then you have to make sure you revoke that refresh token. Otherwise, someone who has that refresh token could for that whatever, however long it lasts, a year, 10 years, whatever, they could keep getting access tokens for that user and potentially doing bad stuff. So it's just one other like security aspect you have to keep, keep track of. No, no, I think that's a good practice. That's one of the um, that's one of the kind of knobs that you can adjust. So for anyone who wasn't able to hear, um, he was just describing that what you can do, you can have really short lived access tokens, which is good for security, because if your to access token only lasts, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or something, then if it's compromised, at least there's a really short window where someone could do any damage. Then you could have long lived refresh tokens, which allow the user to keep getting new access tokens for a long period of time. And that kind of gets around the fact that each access token only lasts for a short amount of time. Um, that at least the, the advantage of doing that kind of short lived access talk token, long lived refresh token is that it makes you having to keep, it means you have to keep checking in with the authorization server with the refresh token to get new access tokens. And that gives you a, a place like a checkpoint where you could, if you needed to like revoke something. Um, it still does mean that you have t two things that you need to like keep track of revoking if you do any type of revocation rather than just one. Um, so yeah, but that's that like long lived, short lived pairing is a pretty common. Yep. Okay. So 
Oh, interesting. And reuse them like, like a loop. Uh, and a request? Every request is, you can access tokens. No, no, the, the Aqua token for five minutes, mm -hmm. and then if it expires, we use a refresh token to go back to the service that, hey, give us the new Aqua mm -hmm. token together with the refresh token. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, good. So pretty much like refresh token used without, as soon as access token expires, we use just refresh token to pull the new access token with a refresh token. And then that will keep going like for five minutes again and again. Mm -hmm. So we never, as soon as the access token expires, the refresh token used to pull the new access token. Yeah. So is there any issue with this? So, so the refresh token is just a little, the life of the refresh token is a little longer than the access token? Yeah, the, the refresh token will give me, I can use and pull brand new. Right, because uh, the access token expired and you're making the request again for the refresh token. That's just sort of the way you just got it. Yeah, like it's 10 minutes uh, versus mm -hmm. 5 minutes on access token, or maybe 30 minutes. Yeah, so what you're describing is kind of like a, like a sliding refresh token, I guess. I don't know if that's the real yeah. term, but that's kind of how I would describe it, where um, you can you can think of a refresh token behaving in one of two ways. Either you use a refresh token and get a new access token, and you always get the same refresh token back, and that has like an absolute lifetime. Or every time you use a refresh token, you get a new refresh token back, and that lifetime, the refresh token lifetime, is allowed to kind of slide along and potentially stay indefinitely um, alive. The, the tricky part about that or the, the the security part that I'd be worried about is that that potentially means that someone could have an unlimited amount of damage that they could do. They would like never get cut off. Um, if they if they compromised your refresh token, then they kind of like have the keys to the kingdom, I guess. Um, if uh, if you never like notice that they compromised your refresh token, um, so usually the best practice that I see is that refresh tokens have an absolute expiration that eventually gets just expires and you always get the same refresh token back, but I've seen it that way too. Um, I'd, be interested to, I'd be interested to understand in your application, we can chat after, um, are, if you're using refresh tokens for that kind of automated, um, the automated use case that I was describing before, or just to keep like a web session alive. Web session alive. Okay. So you can go back to, you can close browser, come back in like in three days, and reopen, reuse the refresh token, then this web gets brand new access token, and yeah. you can go. So yeah. if you came back in three days, wouldn't the refresh token be expired? Because it was only 10 minutes, right? Well, the, the refresh token, um, you can put the longer time for, well, in three days, yes, but you can do like for uh, 24 hours, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, you're, you're trying to solve the case where like someone closed their browser, but then they're like, oh, I, for, I just forgot something. I went right back and I didn't have to log in again. Right. I, think, I think the best way to handle that, like keeping a web session alive, is more the, the flow I described before where you redirect back to the authorization server and let the authorization server keep track of its own session for the user. And that is what kind of like keeps letting you have access tokens. Um, that's not always... I'd be interested to chat with you afterwards. That's not always possible in like some web architectures maybe, but that's, if I was building a new application, that's what I would do. I've built applications in the past that did it like how you're describing where you use a refresh token to get, keep the web session alive. I think I would now use an a session on the authorization server to keep it alive. Any other questions? I had a great time hanging out with you all. Thank you so much for your time. thing and, and, uh, and get out of here. Um, we've got something new today. A uh, book. I don't know how long people have been coming to the past, but 10 years ago, one of our sponsors was O'Reilly, and we always did about five books, and that was it. And uh, um, it's been a while. Uh, we've had books, we've been books like uh, um, Very Related. So this, yeah, this, so this book is um, OWASP 2.0 Simplified. It's by Mr. Aaron Parecki up here. The, the author is here, yeah. so signing, book signing afterwards, <laughs> right? Um, so just wanted to mention about that book. Um, it's a great book. He's a coworker of mine, so um, he's pretty awesome. If you don't get a copy of it tonight, it's also available online at OWASP.com. So it's also a free ebook. Uh, published by Okta. So oh, cool. if you don't get the signed copy in person, just go up to OAuth.com and you can read it online. It's a really good resource if you're doing 
um, OAuth stuff, especially if you're building your own authorization servers and want to understand how all this stuff works. Fantastic. Okay, other things, prizes. We have uh, uh, Vander Howen tumbler of fun. We have a pen in there and maybe some candy. Uh, <laughs> And some gift cards. All gift cards are $25. Uh, two Non Amelia uh, gift cards. Non Amelia is where we get the pizza. Uh, they have other things besides pizza. Um, two Thirsty Lion gift cards. And two um, Regal Cinema $25 gift card courtesy of uh, Vander Helen. Right. Cool. I have, I have something to throw in there too. I have some t shirts as well. Oh, t shirts? Not well, they're Okta t shirts, okay. but close enough. Uh, I have the shirt that I'm wearing right now, which is just like a Okta shirt, and uh, I also have men's or women's. Oh, sorry, these are unisex, so I guess men's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're not. Put it where it is, man. I don't know. Okay. Sorry, I only have one style. They're not. They're not women's style, so I right. assume they're men's okay. style. Sorry. Um, I have a large, and I have a triple XL. Sorry, I was kind of at the bottom of the barrel there. Um, but I also have a really cool shirt. I, <laughs> it's not, that wasn't my joke. Um, I also have a shirt that says, I find your lack of security disturbing in like the Star Wars font. So that's a lot of fun. That is an XL. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, last four numbers are, no, last three numbers. Uh, uh, zero, nine, five. 